and uh, welcome to PDF. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Pro Project ECHO. Today, Dr. Anderson will be presenting to us on pediatric epilepsy. Um, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, if you you may claim your attendance either using the link on our um, CME website, or I also put it in the um, chat function. So um, feel free to use that. And then you'll also receive credit reminders following the presentation. Um, Dr. Anderson received his, his MD PhD from the Indiana University School of Medicine and completed his pediatric residency and pediatric neurology and epilepsy, EEG, sleep and evoked potentials uh, fellowships at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He currently is um, an assistant professor in the Quillen College of Medicine Department of Pediatrics Division of Neurology. And we're looking forward very much to your presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anderson. All right, thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, I'll try to go through this relatively quickly because I think a lot of this will be reviewed for the majority of uh, you. If there's something that's not, feel free to pipe in and ask for a clarification as we go through things. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, I am not a rich man, so therefore I don't have any financial interest in any of the companies or drugs that I'm going to pre present. The International uh, League Against Epilepsy has been around since around 1900, and they have, over the years, came up with several position papers to define how the we uh, describe to someone else uh, what is a seizure and how do we describe the EEGs, et cetera. And in 2000, 2017 is the last revision of this that we had. They had one uh, position paper uh, on classification of the epilepsies. They had another one on the classification of seizure types. And with this, this made everyone around the world be able to talk to each other and use similar terminology. So let's just kind of start from the beginning and we'll kind of work our way through here. What's a seizure? It's a period of symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neural activity in the brain. Another way of thinking about it, it's a clinical expression of abnormal or expressive or synchronous discharges of neurons residing primarily in the cerebral cortex. This abnormal paroxysmal activity is intermittent and usually self-limited, lasting seconds to minutes. And the vast majority of seizures that we do see are less than two minutes. When they get over two minutes, they are very unlikely to stop on their own or much less likely. And after about five minutes, many times it becomes more heroic measures that we have to take to stop them. And that's the reason we have abortive medications that we give to some patients. Does anyone know how to make this thing go off the top of the screen? What are you seeing? Uh, it says mute, stop video, participants chat. That won't go anywhere. You can, you can move it around the screen. Uh, there we go. I'll move it down there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, um, so when a seizure goes too long, what is that? And a seizure when it goes too long is called status epilepticus, as everyone well knows. And where did they come up with some of the definitions for these? And it's kind of changed over the years. Back when I started my training, we said 30 minutes of continuous seizure activity or two or more uh, sequential seizures without a full recovery of consciousness between them lasting 30 minutes. And that data came out of, well, if a seizure goes on for more than about 30 minutes, one, it's not likely to stop. But the other one is that animal, animal models said that those individuals' brains uh, started to have a breakdown of neurons and therefore we do really don't want to go uh, longer than that, and our goal is to get everybody stopped within 30 minutes. Today, we've kind of figured out a couple other things, as I mentioned earlier, and that is if a seizure goes on for more than about five minutes, uh, then it's very unlikely to stop on its own, and that's when we use rescue medications. So what is epilepsy? It's a disease of the brain defined by one of the three following uh, conditions. Number one is that you have two unprovoked reflex seizures more than 24 hours apart. And if you have that, statistically speaking, you've got about a three and four chance of having another seizure over the course of the next 10 years. And the 95% confidence interval, so that is between 60 and 90%. And that is what we use as the standard to say, should we treat a patient or not? Now, if someone has one unprovoked reflex seizure and a 
the probability of further seizures is similar to the general risk of uh, occurrence if you had two unprovoked seizures. And those other things that goes into that would be whether or not you have normal or abnormal EEG, MRI, abnormal neurologic examination, or whether that you have uh, had a seizure from sleep. And if you have a diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. Now, epilepsy is considered to be resolved. In other words, when do you actually say, I don't have epilepsy anymore? And this is something that I don't think a lot of people realize. And that is the fact that if you've got age-dependent epilepsy and you've outgrown it, then you're considered not to have epilepsy anymore. For those that have remained seizure-free for 10 years and not been on medicine for the last five years, we also consider those people to be seizure-free. When we think of seizure types, these are based upon EEG findings. And we have focal onset, generalized onset, or we really can't tell where the seizure starts when we look at the EEG. Now, part of that next step that goes into this is, and what determines whether these are focal or generalized or unknown, is what, how does, why do we have the seizures in the first place? Is it due to some structural abnormality, like they've had a stroke or uh, hypoxic semen encephalopathy? or they have a genetic disorder, have they had meningitis encephalitis, they have a metabolic condition like glucose transporter deficiency, they have autoimmune disease, or we really can't tell what's going on. And this goes into making what the seizures are gonna look like when we actually see them clinically. Are they gonna look focal where they're only shaking on one side or generalized where they seem to be shaking on both? Or do they look start off just, uh, on one side and then go to the other side, or we really can't tell what they're doing. And this all goes into making an epilepsy syndrome. And all of these things have comorbidities that goes along with them. Many of the, of the epilepsy syndromes, such as Lennox-Gastaut, has mental retardation that goes along with it. And several of the others have other consequences as well. When we think of seizure types, there's a lot of expansion that went on in this last update. And a lot of this is being more technical for papers as it opposed to being practical for the, the practical neurologist or pediatrician. And one of the things that we see is, you know, focal onset, whether they're aware or they have impaired awareness. Um, that's basically the same as we used to have, but then they can break it on down into motor onset or non-motor onset, generalized seizures, whether they're motor uh, or whether they're non-motor, like an absence seizure where you just simply stare off and where we're not really sure in the same time this uh, classification is unclassified. <clears throat> now, an example of this would be if someone has tubal sclerosis. There is a structural problem with these individuals in the sense that they have cortical tubers, they have subcortical tubers, uh, and they also have subvenable uh, giant cell astrocytomas. And uh, with those, there is a genetic reason that they have it. If you have uh, tumor sclerosis complex one, you have a 9Q34 uh, genetic variation affecting the Hamerton protein. And if you have TSC2, then you have a uh, 16P13.3 uh, genetic abnormality that causes a uh, problem with the tuber and expression. Another example, a little different, would be glucose transporter one deficiency. In these individuals, they have a defect in the SCA. SLC2A1 gene, so they have a genetic component, but this causes a metabolic component where that glucose cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, these children have terrible seizures. They don't respond to uh, seizure medications, and the only basic treatment that we can offer those individuals is putting them on a ketogenic diet so their brain utilizes something other than glucose for metabolism. When we think of an epilepsy syndrome, there's a lot that goes into configuring that. How old is the patient? What the seizure types that they're having? What the EEG looks like? What their imaging shows? What the seizure itself looks like? Um, and whether the neurological examination is normal or abnormal? And what other comorbidities that, that patient may have? I'm gonna go through a few of these more common ones that we see uh, very frequently in clinic as well as in the hospital setting. And that would be infantile spasms, lennox gastaut syndrome, self-limited epilepsy with central temporal spikes. Uh, missed a little return there, I'm sorry. Uh, childhood absence seizures, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and vitamin dependent epilepsy. So we're gonna kind of run quickly through all of these. Now, infantile spasms is considered to be a generalized epilepsy by EG criteria, its peak incidence is between four and seven months of age. They have extensor or flexor spasms. And the one thing that uh, 
separates that spasm from being a startle or other thing that people look like is that when they get it, they will hold it out there for a couple seconds and then they'll relax. And they may do it over and over again. And at the time of diagnosis, when I end up getting to see them, they may be doing it 500 times a day in uh, several clusters. Um, these are more common around the time of sleep-wake transitions. They can be developmentally normal or abnormal at the time of diagnosis. And visually, uh, many times we can't distinguish them from uh, whether it's one of these things here or whether it's actually seizures. The classic EG finding uh, is a hypsarrhythmia. This is very high amplitude, chaotic, disorganized background. I'll show you a picture of it in a second. And we need to do the EG monitoring to capture a, a seizure to really ensure that we're doing the right thing. Now, West syndrome is something that's basically a triad described by Dr. West, of which you have the patel spasms, a clinical entity, hypsarrhythmy, a, a, a EEG abnormality, and the children will always have developmental delay. Now here, this is hypsarrhythmia. It's very high amplitude, chaotic. This is what a normal EEG will look like at four months of age. This is what hypsarrhythmia looks like. And if you see it on the screen, you can start decreasing the amplitude to try to look at it. And finally, you figure out that this is very abnormal and this is something uh, completely different than what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. By definition, all infantile spasms will eventually go away. The big difference is how long that they have the spasms before that uh, we get them treated. And if we can treat them and get them to stop within 30 days, those individuals tend to have a better outcome than those who don't. However, if you have infantile spasms, the, out, the prognosis is very poor for long-term development. Only about 10% of them will come out normal. And here they're saying, defining normal as being an IQ greater than 70. About 90% will have an IQ less than 70. And about 70% of the total will have an IQ actually less than 50. And those are the ones that I end up seeing the most of. Treatment of choice is ACTH unless they have tuberous sclerosis. And that's part of when these patients are present, we do a very good skin exam to make sure that they don't have any uh, hypopigmented areas to, suggestive of tuberous sclerosis. You can always do a Woods lamp exam to uh, look at it a little more closely. And I've seen several of these on the unit over the last uh, year and tried to show the residents uh, what these actually look like. If the patient has tuberous sclerosis, the drug of choice is Sable or Vigabitrin that we use. Now, some patients with infantile spasms will ex experience a complete remission and never have another seizure uh, and continue to have normal development. Often though, these will transition to other seizure types. Number one transition is Lennox Gastaut syndrome. Now, Lennox Gastaut syndrome is considered to be a generalized epilepsy with onset between one and eight years of age, most between three and five. A lot of the patients with infantile spasms present very early. By a year of age, they've determined for it to be Lennox Gastaut. These are always developmentally delayed. The severity of that developmental delay is quite varied, but most of them uh, are more toward the more severe region. Um, and when you look at these as a group, at least a fourth of them will have a history of infantile spasm. When we look at the EG, the classic finding is one to two and a half hertz slow spike and wave, test question for residents. Um, these are the kids that are in, have multiple seizure types. They can have tonic, atonic. Those two types of seizures are the ones that buy these kids to wear the helmet. So if you see a child with epilepsy who's wearing a helmet, that's why they have tonic or atonic. And what they do, they either fall like a board of the tonic seizure or they have an atonic seizure and they fall to the ground like jello and they don't protect themselves. They bang their head, they bash their lips, they knock out their teeth. Atypical absence are basically the typical absence, but except these can go on for 30 minutes, an hour or longer. And the kids will just kind of wander around kind of hopelessly looking around at nothing and not really accomplishing much. Myoclonic seizures can happen at any time, any body part. And when they, ha they happen, they tend to uh, fall down they may or may not protect themselves when they fall. And then we all know about what a generalized tonic-clonic seizure is. The major goal with these kids is not seizure freedom, as we have for most all the other epilepsies, but our goal is more to stop the seizures that cause them harm, basically the tonic and the atonic seizure. This is an EEG of someone with lennox gastaut syndrome, and this is where you can see that slow spike and slow wave. And if we see that on EEG, that is very often associated with mental retardation and um, multiple seizure types. Moving on to the next one here. Um, 
Self-limited epilepsy with central temporal spikes. This was one of the things that was changed in 2017. Instead of calling something benign, anything that had the word benign in it, bought the word self-limited instead. So if you see anything with self-limited in it, as far as an explanation for a seizure type, then think of that this is actually benign as you may have heard it in the past. So benign neurologic epilepsy is self-limited epilepsy with central temporal spikes. It's considered to be a focal epilepsy, it's onset between five and nine years of age, and it's the most common uh, childhood epilepsy that we see and seeing 10 to 20% of childhood epilepsy. The patients are generally developmentally normal. And the one thing we got to remember is that the central temporal spikes are increased as they go to sleep. And there are about a third of the patients that will see no spikes during wakefulness or drowsiness. It's only when they completely go to sleep that we'll actually be able to see those spikes. And that's the reason that on all the EEGs, we really push to try to get a sleep sample in there so we can rule these out um, as part of the diagnosis. Many of the other sleep uh, children who have other epilepsies, uh, as they go to sleep, their seizures may look completely different than they do when they're actually awake. The classic seizure of hypersalivation, speech arrest, uh, unilateral, sensimotor, focial, um, and oral motor symptoms are pretty common. Those are things that we see very frequently. Um, they can have the generalized tonic-clonic seizures as well, and one of them may progress to the other one. The good news is that these patients will outgrow these as they grow uh, through puberty uh, around 12 or 15 years of age. This is the uh, spikes that we talked about here in the temporal and here in the central region with central temporal spikes. They do actually have a specific orientation. And this person is actually awake uh, when they're having these, but as I mentioned, about a third of the patients will not have them at all when they're awake. Going on to the next type of uh, childhood epilepsy is absence epilepsy. These previously were called petty mal seizures and uh, it's considered to be a generalized epilepsy onsets between four and 10 years of age. And the specific EG finding that we're looking for is three hertz uh, spike and slow wave activity. If you have a EG in the sleep deprived state with good hyperventilation and it comes back normal, there's less than a 10% chance that patient is going to have uh, absence epilepsy. So you can take your, that and throw it out the window. Um, and I would tend to say if with a really good hyperventilation and they were very sleep deprived, that's probably closer to 100. Now the classic seizures, these brief staring episodes where they will be talking and they'll keep on going. That part there is the question to ask if you're suspecting that someone has absence seizures. And part of the way that you could distinguish it from ADHD or other just daydreaming is the fact that they will have periodically events where they'll stop talking in the middle of a sentence, but it's just in the wrong spot to, um, to pause. These can occur hundreds of times a day at the time of diagnosis. If the seizures last more than five to 10 seconds, which they very well may can in the untreated state, um, that you will have uh, lip smacking, um, some picking of, of their uh, clothing or having some eye flutter with it. And these, as I mentioned, can be uh, confused with uh, daydreaming and ADHD. Now, when you think of the kids as a whole, they uh, typically have normal development. At least 90% of them will outgrow them as they go through puberty. And the traditional jug of choice for a test question is cephalosuximide, although I don't use it that much because there's, there's better drugs to use, such as uh, levotracetam, lamotrigine, uh, valparator, the patterses, and isomide. And this is the typical EEG that we see in someone with absence epilepsy. They have this three hertz beautiful spike and slow wave occurring. As soon as it's over, the EEG goes right back to normal, such as what we see in a patient without the epilepsy. Moving on to the next type, uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. This is also considered to be a generalized epilepsy, typically uh, has onset between ages of 12 and 18 after they go through puberty. Um, it occurs in developmentally normal children, although they can be developmentally delayed as well. This is considered to be genetically in origin. Um, they have the specific EEG pattern of three to six hertz polyspike and slow of activity uh, in between between seizures, and that's what we're looking for on the EEGs when we see them. The important thing to make about this uh, being a syndrome is the fact 
what medication choices that we're going to place them on. They need to be able to treat generalized seizures, but they're going to be on this medication for the rest of their life. Even though their seizures may become easier to control as they get older, they will always have to stay on a seizure medicine as they get older. JME is a triad, and I put it on here in order of appearance, of seizure types. The absent seizures, myoclonic seizures, and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. The absence seizures are the typical brief staring spells that we see in the childhood absence. It generally comes on about age 12 and a half, right about the time of puberty. And at least 20 to 40% of the kids will have them, but probably many more of them actually do, but they're undiagnosed at the time of presentation. They will always occur, you know, maybe even three to five years before this. So the patients will be going into high school because they're or junior high, and they start becoming inattentive. They think they're developing some ADHD symptoms. They're not interested in school. And then they start becoming, having myoclonic jerks around age 15. These are generally small. The kids are considered to be clumsy. They will drop things. They trip over thin air. And sometimes they're the laughing stock of the family and all their friends at school as well. But they're actually seizures. And then the thing that brings them in to see everybody is when they have their first generalized tommy clonic seizure. And that may not be up until, you know, age uh, 17 or so. But more than 90% of the kids will have had one by the time that they are diagnosed. And um, these are most common in the morning, uh, especially upon awakening or when they get tired at the end of the day. This is that poly spike and slow of activity that I mentioned. Um, this is part of that generalized epilepsy syndrome. This is a rare entity, but it comes up as a test question not infrequently, and that is pyridoxine dependent uh, response of epilepsy. These kids come in as neonates, they start having seizures. We do the EEG and it looks awful, and they're not doing so well clinically as well. And then we try to treat them with one, two, three seizure medications. And lo and behold, it just doesn't really help the seizures at all. Um, and when that comes up, we need to start thinking, you know, is this pyridoxine? And if they're on EEG monitoring, you give them 100 milligrams of pyridoxine. And over the next 30 minutes, their EEG will normalize. And their seizure medicine for the rest of their life turns out to be pyridoxine. They take 100 milligrams a day, and they'll never have a seizure probably for the rest of their life. When you have your first seizure, what should you or what should you not do? Well, febrile seizures are not seizures. They're not epilepsy. Um, they're seizures uh, that only occur with fever. They'll never have a seizure without fever. If they have one seizure without fever, then that becomes epilepsy. Now, a seizure with fever is not necessarily provoked, as in a febrile seizure, and an afebrile seizure is definitely not provoked. We consider hospitalizing, <coughs> excuse me, these kids. I can move this thing out of the way. Does this show up on your screens? Um, anyway. Willie, no, it doesn't. We can just see the slides. You can just see the slides. Okay, thanks. Because I keep on moving it around and it gets up getting in the way. Anyway, okay. So when you hospitalize a patient, when they come in a status up left, they're probably going to um, need to be hospitalized. One thing for residents to consider, any patient that comes into the ER and they are still seizing, they are always in status epilepticus, whether or not the seizure stopped or recurred. That goes back to not regaining normal mental status between seizures. Uh, if someone's had a cluster of seizures and they're just not seeming to stop or responding to their uh, abortive medications, when they don't return to normal mental status after seizures, we're thinking subclinical status epilepticus. And those are the kids that we bring in, we hook them up to EEG and make sure that they're not having seizures that we can't appreciate by clinical examination. If they have other conditions going on, they were under trauma, they were in a car accident or whatever the case may be, or we have concerns because they're febrile and they're not, their mental status is abnormal, they've got some nuclear rigidity and we're thinking they may have encephalitis and meningitis, or we need to bring them in to figure out exactly what's going on because it's not the first time that they presented to the ER or to your office. I'm going to mention a couple of things about febrile seizures just to refresh everyone's memory. Um, even though this is not epilepsy, uh, remember they must be between six months and five years of age. The temp must be 30, greater than 38 or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The reason that these kids stop having seizures is that their body mass 
when they hit about full 40 pounds or, uh, or four years of age, definitely by five years of age, is they cannot generate a rapid rise in their core body temperature fast enough to provoke a seizure. And that's the reason that these kids will outgrow the se their seizures. Um, they fall into two broad categories. One is central febrile seizures. You don't need to do anything else. And the ones that are complex febrile seizures, and they need to be seen by me and have further evaluation. The central febrile seizures, by definition, are generalized. They are not focal. They're not meaning they're not only shaking on one side of the body. They're less than 15 minutes of duration. And they do not recur within 24 hours of the first seizure. However, complex, far, com complex febrile seizures are just the opposite. You have shaking potentially on just one side of the body. They last longer than 15 minutes, or they have multiple seizures within a 24-hour period. The risk of epilepsy after simple febrile seizures is only slightly higher than the general population, even if they happen to turn into that complex febrile seizure group. Uh, the main risk of uh, simple febrile seizures is recurrence of those. About a third of the kids will have more than one. Things that makes it more likely for you to have more than one seizure would be less than 18 months of age at the first seizure, particularly less than one year of age, fever duration of less than an hour before the first seizure, uh, having a first degree relative with febrile seizures, or a temp of less than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So the person that comes in, they've got a temp of 101. I'm pretty suspect that that's probably not a febrile seizure, but more a seizure with fever. When do they have that next seizure? About half of them will do it in the next six months, 75% of it within a year, and about 90% within two years. One thing we learned a long time ago after multiple, multiple studies when they came up with Motrin and then they tried it with Tylenol or vice versa or both, combination is you cannot prevent a febrile seizure. They've given this to families with kids with febrile seizures and lo and behold, they basically have the seizure before that they realize that they're getting sick. So they come into your office and present with their first um, provoked seizure. Um, the seizure was self-limited, less than five minutes of it, uh, in length. There was another other complicating factors. They didn't have, uh, they were not particularly sick. They did not have symptoms that made you suspect they may have encephalitis, meningitis, um, or brain tumor. But we do due diligence and we order a sleep deprived EEG um, and we order a brain MRI using an epilepsy protocol. And we do that so that we will allow structural etiologies for the seizures, such as tumor, cortical malformations, vascular malformations, evidence of a prior stroke, or CNS infection. And I usually use the rule that if they're receiving sedation, I order with GATO. If they're not receiving uh, sedation, then I don't order the GATO, um, trying to decrease MRI time a little bit. Um, I encourage everybody to be very generous in ordering sedation. It takes an hour to do the epilepsy protocol. And if they move, we get a movement of gram and it really yields uh, little or no information. If the studies are normal, you can watch them. They don't necessarily need to come over and see me unless additional questions arise. However, if any of those are abnormal, uh, meaning the EEG, the MRI, their history of nocturnal seizures, um, then they cross that 60% uh, risk and we would consider treatment with first line antioxidant medication. <laughs> An EEG assesses seizure risk. It does not tell me whether that person had a seizure or not. And I always order a sleep deprived with the goal of them going to sleep during the study. I usually will order a 61 to 121, 120 minute study to maximize the possibility of obtaining sleep. How much sleep deprivation they get kind of depends on what the parents are telling me and your clinical judgment looking at that patient. If the parent or the child is exceedingly anxious, they're unlikely to go to sleep, even staying up all night potentially, um, then I usually use clonidine for sedation. Um, if we give it 30 minutes prior to the seizure, uh, right before that they put on their armband. Uh, dose kind of uh, two and a half to five mics per kilogram. And um, I use 0.1 milligram uh, tablet. They can dissolve it up a little bit of something. They can give it a teaspoon from applesauce putting your yogurt if they don't swallow tablets. So that would be a kind of a, a representative uh, dose that I may use. And if the parents aren't sure how much they need, they can give them a dose in the afternoon after lunch and see if they lay down and want to take a nap or they continue to play. If they continue to play, you probably should give a higher uh, dose of the range. When you get an EEG report back, what does it say? Well, most of them uh, will say 
but first thing it says on there, the study was blank during wakefulness, drowsiness, and sleep. And what blank is, normal or abnormal. Then you'll get one of about six variations with a minor uh, things added with that. No epileptiform activity was recorded. Note that a normal study does not rule out epilepsy. That is very important because it only assesses seizure risk at the time of the study. There was focal cortical neural dysfunction of the blank uh, region with the type seen of patients with seizures of focal onset. Going back to the focal epilepsies that we talked about earlier with or without secondary generalization. These findings indicate generalized cortical neural dysfunction of the type seen of patients with primary generalized epilepsy. The kids who come in with absence epilepsy or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It can also come back saying that I saw that slow spike and slow wave I mentioned, and these findings indicate generalized cortical neural dysfunction of the type seen in patients with Lennox Gusto syndrome. This epilepsy is strongly associated with seizures of multiple types and mental retardation. It can also come back saying not increased risk of seizures um, with there was focal cortical neural dysfunction of the right temporal region of the type seen in patients with a structural or functional lesion in that brain region. Now that may be that they've got a tumor there, they had a stroke as a newborn, or it may be the fact that they've had multiple seizures there, but we just didn't capture any spikes on the EEG. Um, and that brain is kind of trying to recover from uh, the seizures. Or the last one on here was, there was generalized cortical neural dysfunction of the type seen in patients with mild encephalopathy that may in part be due to medication effect. And that is those kids that are encephalopathic, they're functionally slow, um, at baseline or they are on multiple medications and that definitely can cause the EEG to slow. I read all the EEGs from uh, here at uh, Johnson City uh, Medical Center. I also read them at Indian Path and at Bristol Regional Medical Center. I read a few from Holston Valley, but we moved all the pediatric studies over to Indian Path a few months ago. So if you get a order a study, it comes back abnormal and you wanna to talk to me about how to treat them or what medications to start them on before that they can potentially get in to see me, feel free to call or text me. Um, that's my cell number, or you can reach me through ND Connect. I would much prefer to do that and help the patient than I would be to go out and um, have them wait to see me in a couple months and they continue to have seizures. When you go in to take a seizure history, uh, this may be the first opportunity to document on the chart what exactly happened and the closest to when the event actually happened. I may not see them for several months and they come in and they go, I don't know, um, I don't remember. Um, but the thing you got to remember is don't lead the patient, at least initially. And the best question to ask is, what was the first thing that you noticed that says something was wrong? And it may be they heard a knocking on the wall, they may have noticed that they fell to the floor and then they kind of tell you their part of the story. And after they've kind of said their piece, then go back and ask them more specifics. Was their eyes open or closed? The vast majority of kids with epilepsy, epileptic seizures, uh, even if it occurs at three in the morning, will open their eyes up, have their seizure, and then go back to sleep. Uh, if their eyes closed, we're thinking that maybe a non-epileptic event, uh, such as they uh, had syncope or something else going on. Their gaze, is it up left, looking to the right, left, or up? Same with head turning. Are their arms, legs, uh, they stiff, limp, were they all doing the same thing on one side of our body, both sides of the body, and were they stay shaking tonically or were they making rhythmic movements? The seizure's over when it goes shaking because when the parents timed the seizure, it lasted about 20 minutes. That was before that they were waking up from their little nap afterwards and started talking to them and answering questions. But the seizure is actually over when the shaking stops. And also ask them whether or not they had any focal deficits. In other words, looking for a Todd's paralysis. That would be a localizing factor that I can look for on the EG as well. Now, our epilepsy treatment goals is always 100% seizure control. Uh, we want to maximize their hints to taking medication. We want one that has minimal side effects, and the newer seizure medicines are much better in the older uh, medications as far as their side effect profiles. Minimize the number of doses they have to take per day. Um, we always want to get a formulation that they can uh, actually get down them. Uh, if they can't swallow a pill, it doesn't do any good to give them a pill. Therefore, we can give them a liquid or a sprinkle uh, with some medications. I hate liquids from the standpoint that you cannot put it into a pill box, but you can uh, use a pill box. And that way, if your schedule is off, someone's sick, 
or someone else is trying to help you out take their medicine, you can look at the pillbox to tell whether or not they took their medicine that day. And cell phones are wonderful. You can set an alarm on your phone to remind you to go take your medicine or take give your kids their medicine. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here is the fact that, well, we really aren't as good as you guys think we are when it comes to treating seizures. Um, Quan and Brody produced this back when the first one 30 years ago when I was doing my training. And we all looked at this data and said, this can't be true. But when we actually started following our patients and looking at this more closely, we figured out that it really was true. And the numbers were appalling. And that is, if you have someone who comes in with new onset epilepsy, they get started on the appropriate anti-epileptic medication, 50.5% will receive seizure freedom for the first year after the first seizure medicine. That's it. Second drug will give you another 11.6% and take you up to 62.1% being seizure free for one year. And yet on a third medicine and you're down at another 4.1% and gets you up to about two thirds or 66.2% of the patients being seizure free. These numbers have been true back when this first started 30 years ago, utilizing uh, phenobarbital, dilantin, Depakote, and carbamazepine, and all the newer anti medications have really not changed these numbers at all when you look at all comers. So if we get out here after two medicines and they're failing it, that's when we need to consider what else we may do to help with their seizures. And definitely by the time that we get out to failing third medication, we need to say, what else do we need to do for that patient? Because their chances of becoming seizure free after that, despite changing medicine after medicine after medicine is extremely low. Now we may decrease their seizures further and further and further and or improve their quality of life, but that's as far as it goes. So when we started about treatment, we consider medication. There's some medications that are only good for treating focal seizures like oxycarbazepine uh, or carbamazepine or dilantin. Uh, they have generalized onset. We want ethosuximide for absence seizures potentially or lamotrigine, Depakote, et cetera. And some of them, uh, ethosuximide would be for generalized onset only, or you get some that'll treat both focal and generalized seizures such as uh, Depakote, Zonagran, Lamictal, et cetera. After they failed two medications, particularly three medications, are they an epilepsy surgery candidate? In other words, they've got one part of their brain that's bad. We can go and take out that part of it and cure their seizures over their lifetime. That'll greatly improve the quality of life should they continue to have seizures. If they're not a focal seizure candidate, then we can consider giving them a vagal nerve stimulator to decrease their seizures. It virtually has no side effects from it. And uh, the ketogenic diet is something that we can give in some of those kids that are very young, motivated, and or have a G2. When they have a seizure that doesn't start off after five minutes, I usually use three minutes in many of my kids because parents can't uh, multitask to remember to do two things at the same time, such as give them diastat and call 911. So I usually tell parents uh, three minutes, hopefully they've got the diastat or other abortive medication in by five minutes. And if it's continuing five minutes after onset, then to call 911 uh, to ass get assistance. Diastat is the first one that we came out that was a true uh, life changer for many patients. It is diazepam rectal gel, and it's based upon weight and age for dosing, such as they're between two and five years of age, they're between 21 and 25 ki uh, kilograms, that we would give them 12 and a half milligrams of uh, diastat to use. Um, six months to two years, I usually do the dosing of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and um, they'll either take two and a half or five milligrams, depending on their weight. Less than six months, we usually don't give diastat other than uh, unusual circumstances. One of the newer medications that came out is Valtoco. This is uh, intranasal Valium. Uh, it's utilized only for patients that are six years and up. And with that, it's based upon weight. The thing you got to remember, there are five, seven and a half and 10 milligram uh, dosing of it. And depending on their weight is what their dose is going to be. So if they are, for instance, um, 19 to 37 kilograms in between stages of six and 11, then I would give them one 10 milligram device to, with instructions of one spray in one nostril. However, if they were um, 51 to 75 uh, kilograms and they were over age 12, their dose would be 15 milligrams and they would get two seven and a half milligram devices and they put one spray in each nostril. 
The third medication is nasolam. This is only for twin individuals 12 years and up. It's a single dose uh, nasal spray of five milligrams of midazolam or Versed um, and 0.1 milligrams of solution. The initial dose is one spray or five milligrams. If the seizure hasn't stopped in 10 minutes, you give a second spray um, of the medication. I don't use the things other than diastate, diastat on a regular basis, in particular because I can get two diastats for about a hundred bucks. These are over $500 per use. And so um, to utilize the funds, it's there. But if I get a 300 pound person, it's really hard to roll them onto their side and give them diastat up the backside when I can get one of these into their nose. And with a little bit of prior approval, you can get them approved on Medicaid. Seizure precautions is probably one of the most important things that you can give uh, <coughs> to a parent um, because they are scared to death when they come to see you. And that is, you know, they tell them to take showers, not baths. If they take a bath, uh, make sure that they're supervised um, and there's no exceptions to that rule. If they go swimming and they're in a swimming pool, they weigh 250 pounds, their mom's 110 pounds or dad's 150, they're probably not going to be able to get them out of the bottom of the deep end of the pool and they still want to go swimming. Uh, that's fine, but they wear a life jacket that'll keep their head above water. Bodies don't keep your head above water, therefore don't ever expect it to save your life. And if you go over to a lake or river or ocean, you can't see the bottom, you got to wear a life jacket. There are no exceptions for that. Um, if you're going to go out in a boat, not a problem, but put on your life jacket before you leave land, because once you get on that dock, it's more than knee deep. You cannot see the bottom and you cannot find the person that they would go down. If they haven't gone at least six months for Tennessee, and other states got different uh, expectations, uh, but when they come in for the new onset seizures, they definitely cannot drive any motorized vehicles, whether that's battery or gas powered, uh, for a minimum of six months. And I usually say also after having an EG that shows they're not having subclinical seizures, they cannot shoot firearms. You don't want them to go out hunting and uh, have that, um, shoot one of their uh, person other than that comes out with them. And sometimes the parents will put the question to me, Cole, can they do this or this or this or this? And I basically put the question back to them. Well, what would be the worst thing that would happen if they had a seizure while doing it? And if it makes you nervous, don't do it. When it comes to seizure first aid, what to do when they have that seizure, there are multiple uh, different uh, posters, et cetera, you can get throughout the, uh, on the internet. Through the, this one is through the uh, American Epilepsy Society or Epilepsy Foundation. Um, I generally use my own kind of version of a similar thing. I generally tell the parent, parents the first thing you need, three things you need to do is don't panic. And the reason is we're, it's very rare for a child to die of a seizure. Uh, I do tell them that there is something called sudden unexplained death of epilepsy. I bring broach that up front, uh, but there's nothing we can do about it right now other than try to control our seizures. And that we think seizures lasting as long as 30 minutes do not cause additional brain injury. Therefore, your child that had the seizure for 30 seconds is very unlikely to uh, change the future. You gotta look at a clock. A second seems like a minute. A minute seems like an hour when your child's doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And wherever you're having the seizure, that's where you want to leave them. Move things away from them if you need to. Never put anything in their mouth. It's an old wife's tail if they swallow their tongue. And if they're sitting there eating a uh, chicken bone, you can pull the bone out of them, but never try to get the food out of their mouth. When the seizure's over, they'll continue to chew their food and swallow it. You don't need to restrain them. If they're sitting there jerking, that's what God meant for them to do, and let them do it. That's okay. Pretty common term, blue around lips and fingertips. It's not because they do not have enough oxygen. It's because that they uh, are having part of that fight or flight response and the blood flow is going to where it needs to go, muscle and brain. They're also not uh, breathing normally. It may sound terrible, <laughs> but it's not choking. Choking is when they put their hand up around their throat and they squeeze. And this is just noisy breathing. It's nothing more than that, but parents kind of get freaked out about it. They're also not swallowing normally. They pull saliva, they're not breathing normally, they pull bubbles and all that, that's foaming in the mouth, big deal. I just present it to parents that way and they kind of take it in that uh, line of thought. If you can, turn the head to the side or roll uh, to the side so the saliva runs out. If they happen to choke and throw up, it also helps it to run out. I do tell them if you have a seizure that goes on for more than five minutes, they injure themselves, they turn more blue around the lips and fingertips or they're not returning to baseline following the seizure, absolutely call 911.
I will mention this on here because we'll get about one a month on the floor or more uh, that comes in with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Um, these are also known as pseudo seizures, stress seizures, psychogenic seizures. Um, basically, it's conversion disorder on the psychiatric side as far as the diagnosis. Generally, the eyes are uh, tightly closed and you try to open up their eyes, they will resist it. They will hold their eyes very uh, tightly closed for that. Sensitivity is probably 65 to 75% um, with a specificity of greater than 75%. Um, it's pretty rare to have a kid leave their eyes open um, and be having a non-epileptic event. Sometimes they do, but if they do, they are watching you walk around the room to see what you're doing. Um, that's clearly not a seizure, which is they're taking on both sides. Movements of the extremities are not rhythmic. They're not synchronous. Frequently, they'll have trunk and pelvic movements. They're just kind of writhing in the bed. These events are, events are generally uh, prolonged over two minutes, may last as long as 10 to 60 minutes, and that's not uncommon in being quite variable at how uh, long that they actually uh, will last. And afterwards, uh, you, during the event, you may be able to get them to follow directions. Um, can you get more toward the middle of the bed? I'm afraid you're gonna fall off. They'll move back over to the middle of the bed. Um, and afterwards, they may not be postictal, but they may be very tired because they've been doing a whole lot of energy while they've been expending this, um, having the event. This is not malingering. That has secondary gain. And by that, um, I generally explain it to parents. This is more of a reaction to stress. What is stress to them is not a real stress to me. One thing you got to keep in mind is that at least a third, probably two thirds of these individuals have a history of sexual abuse. You have to ask the question if you want to get the answer to that one. Uh, if once I prove that it's not uh, a epileptic event, then I leave, usually leave that up to uh, psychiatry or to the floor team to have a more in-depth confirmation with them. Uh, being a female sex is also an increased risk as well as uh, having a history of uh, PTSD. Many times we'll have to do inpatient video G monitoring, to capture an event to really tell what's going on. And then you refer to a, a psychiatrist. It's nice if you can find one that has an interest in this, otherwise they may not get them into the most appropriate uh, comprehensive evaluation and uh, treatment program. And they'll continue to do this for years for the rest of their life. Six items you can think about when someone is having one of these to try to help identify between epileptic seizures versus non-epileptic seizures. One of those is, was their eyes opened or closed? Pretty simple. Particularly if they're having an event and you try to open their eyes and they resist you, it's very unlikely to be a epileptic seizure. Is their head fixed or turned to one side or is it sitting there going all over the place? Um, are the limbs, are they in phase? Are they shaking at the same time? Are they out of phase? Are they just not rhythmic at all? the body axis straight. Most patients that you see with seizures, they're lying there stiff as a board on the bed and their limbs are shaking. Where these patients, they'll have unusual uh, positions on the bed. They'll be writhing in the bed, as I mentioned, and kind of rotating uh, their body. Um, and then the, the evolution of the actual event itself. Uh, seizures, they kind of shake more frequently at the beginning and then they start to slow down as the uh, seizure nears its end. These, they may be shaking hard, they get a second wind, they shake even harder. Sorry. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. Now, I'm going to kind of leave it open to see if anybody's got questions for me here. Otherwise, I'm going to run through a few cases pretty quickly to give you some up, uh, things to think about. Do you want to have questions? Uh, must have been that clear on things. All right, case one. This is a little six-year-old girl who comes in. I'm sorry. This is Dave Wood. I have a question. Sure. So, if we have a uh, you know a person in our in our practice, and for me it might be an adolescent, but we think they've had two let's say generalized seizures. You know, one a while ago, and then another one, and then the EEG and MRI, which that. Order for the MRI, that was very helpful for me to know how to order the MRI, but if that's all normal, can we start a seizure of medicine and what would you suggest or should they all be started by you? <coughs> well, that's a point of um, contention. And I always say, if in doubt, don't. And the reason is, how long am I going to treat the patient? If I have an abnormality on an EEG, I can definitely do that. And many things, when the parents give you the story, it may sound like a seizure, but it really wasn't. And 
Um, that's where we're kind of taking a second history. Um, if you have a positive EEG and you have uh, a normal MRI, I would, and everything makes concordance and you're a comfortable with giving them appropriate medication, I would not tell you not to do it. If you ever have any second questions to that, feel free to send me a text if it's during the day and I'll try to call you back between patients um, or you can give me a call if it's after hours or whatever. I'll be happy to talk to you about what the EEG showed. Uh, when I first came I here, I did try to call everybody with an abnormal EEG, but I figured out that I ended up playing more phone tag and was more frustrating to the pediatricians than I was to myself probably. Um, so I've quit calling everybody uh, with every abnormal EEG, but I encourage you to kind of contact me if you have any questions. Thank you, Will. No problem. All right, so this is case one. Here's a little six-year-old girl presenting with her first clinical seizure. Her parents report that she went to bed, came out of the room. They were pointing at her mouth. She wasn't able to talk. She may have been uh, drooling on the floor a little bit there. Uh, then she fell to the ground, had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure lasting less than a minute. They activated EMS. By the time EMS arrived about five minutes later, she was able to answer some simple questions, but was still very tired, sleepy, a little confused. She was taken to the emergency room uh, for evaluation. She had no evidence of a recent illness. Her exam was normal at that point. They had a head CT that was also normal. Ballistic blood chemistries were normal. And she was recommended to come and see her pediatrician later that day. Anything comes to mind? Residents? Anybody can chat her in. All right, if you were listening earlier, by age and history, you're kind of thinking this is well, that self-limited epilepsy with central temporal spikes used to be known as benign Orlandic epilepsy. You question the parents and she's had five episodes of enuresis in the past month uh, after being since dry since age three. And a word about enuresis, if a patient has enuresis after they've been dry for a period of probably three to six months, it's a seizure until proven otherwise unless they've got something else going on. They got a bad urinary tract infection or they had a severe illness. But in the setting of epilepsy, I consider those all to be seizures that we missed. You order an EEG, you get back the report, and it says it was normal during wakefulness and drowsiness. Any of the residents kind of tell me what's wrong with that? Boy, I got the tongue today. All right, normal EEG does not rule out that this is epilepsy. You still strongly suspect this kid has epilepsy, and uh, so you order a longer study, 61 to 120 minutes, and you have them go to bed three hours late, get up three hours early in the night prior to the EEG. You get back this report, and it's uh, abnormal during wakefulness, drowsiness, and sleep. These findings indicate focal cortical neural dysfunction in the left central temporal brain region of the type seen of patients with self limited epilepsy with central temporal spikes, formerly known as benign neurologic epilepsy with central temporal spikes. They get referred over to see me um, for evaluation and treatment. The ictal semiology, what she, what the parents saw, what the EEG looked like, all go together, and we make a diagnosis of benign neurologic epilepsy or self-limited epilepsy with central spikes. Now, in this patient, I would treat them because they've got an abnormal EEG, they've got a clinical seizure that goes with that EEG, and they've had five episodes of enuresis. So I started the amoxicillin and titrated them up to 30 milligrams per kilogram divided by BID. You cannot be ever be 100% that everything looks like what it actually is. It's possible that they had a sylvian fissure tumor on there that's causing it to look like this. So I go ahead and order a brain MRI uh, for this patient. Any questions on that one? Okay, I'm just going to go through a couple of these very quickly here. Uh, if anybody wants to leave, thank you for uh, listening to me today and apologize for running a little over here. This is a 15 year old boy comes in with his first clinical seizure. His father reports that he was getting ready for work this morning around 5.30 a.m. and heard a, heard a noise like somebody was beating on the wall in his son's room, went in there and found him having a generalized tonic clonic seizure, lasted less than two minutes. Had some bloody foam coming out of his mouth where he bit his tongue or cheek. And after the seizure, he immediately went to sleep. EMS arrived, but they could not arouse him even to be pain at that point. Uh, he was taken to the ER, no evidence of illness. His uh, head CT, blood chemistries, urine drug screen were all normal, and it was recommended to come and see his pediatrician later that morning. You ask him about enuresis after the last uh, case, and there was none. You ordered to sleep deprived EEG with him going to bed 
uh, uh, not going to bed rather going the, the night prior to the study. Um, you notice that um, he reports that he is very anxious and is very unlikely to go back to sleep. So you prescribe him clonidine, 0.1 milligram tablets given to him 30 minutes prior to the EEG. And that'll help him to calm down and be more relaxed to get this done and maybe even fall asleep during the study. Um, remember when you tell the patients to have the clonidine, you got to take it with them for number one and number two, they got to put it on, take the medication prior to putting on the armband because once they put on the armband, those are hospital property and you cannot take it out of a hospital medication. Um, the EG was abnormal during wakefulness, jostling, and sleep. These findings indicate generalized cortical neuronal dysfunction of the type seen in patients with primary generalized epilepsy, most commonly juvenile myoclonic epilepsy in this age group. So this is probably JME. He's referred over to see me for evaluation and treatment. We uh, take some more questions. It seems like his grades have dropped. Uh, he's not been paying attention in class. This has been over the last one or two school years. Um, they've noticed that he stops talking periodically in the middle of a sentence. Uh, his family and his friends, they think of him as being a clust because he's dropping things. He trips over things in the air and falls down. Um, he reports that he feels jumpy in the morning. And um, they've had a couple of mornings this school year where they actually couldn't get him out of bed and he slept another couple hours. Uh, the EEG and the history is very supportive of a diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. This has probably been going on for several years. We started him on uh, Keppra, Levotiracetam, 30 milligrams per kilogram divided BID. And even though Jamie is the most uh, likely diagnosis, we also ordered a brain MRI with uh, gadolinium. And because he's got such severe um, anxiety and has also got a little claustrophobia, we ordered this with uh, general sedation so we can get it so we can get a good study. Case three is a five-year-old boy that had frequent um, staring spells by his teacher. Teacher talked to mom and dad, concerned that he might have ADHD. Uh, you listen to it and it's like, hmm, is this a uh, child had absence of seizures or is he actually daydreaming, have ADHD, or does he have absence epilepsy? So the kids were uh, daydreaming. You can ask him, is he like school? Would he prefer to do anything else? And I hate going to school. It's boring. I'd rather be home playing with my cars. And he just maybe daydreaming a little bit. And the parents say, you know, when he comes home, he does his homework very quickly. You don't have any trouble doing that. And he does, gets everything done. The teachers will never say he's got any behavior problems. And it kind of takes ADH off of the list. And so you ask the kind of the killer question of, has he ever stopped talking in the middle of a sentence? And they say, sure, he started doing that about two months ago. And it's very annoying when he does this. So you're highly suspecting that this child might have absence epilepsy. You order sleep deprived EEG with four hours of sleep night and the night prior to the study. He comes in and sure enough, he's got um, primary generalized epilepsy. We refer him over to see me for evaluation and treatment. Um, the parents have noticed that he's falling behind in school, but he did well in his uh, first semester of kindergarten. Um, he was in soccer. They've also noticed that he'd be running down the field, full stream, kicking the ball. All of a sudden he'll just kind of slow down, stop. The other kids will come up, take the ball, and he'll stand there for a few seconds and then take off. And he's done it several times in a single game. Um, so BG and the history, all concordant with the diagnosis of childhood absence epilepsy. And after discussion of medications, we started on the trazotam, 30 milligrams per kilogram, divided BID. Um, we ordered MRI just to make sure we're not missing something. We educate the parents that there's a high probability these can outgrow these as he goes through puberty. Case four is a two-year-old with normal growth and development. Uh, they're not ill. Um, they're at daycare. Teacher noted them to become angry. Uh, and then they had a seizure that lasted about 45 seconds and they were shaking all over is what the, that the parents will tell you. Since we're short on time, I'll kind of run through here. A possible diagnosis for this could be a breath holding spell. And you can fall to the floor, lay there limp, lifeless, eyes closed for 20 to 40 seconds, and then have a anoxic seizure. And that is not uncommon. They come into the ER all the time. This could also have been if they had syncope because they saw blood or they just had a syncopal event. I usually recommend getting at least an EKG, if not a cardiac evaluation, to make sure they don't have some predisposing arrhythmia. And the seizure does not need any further evaluation and or treatment. If they fell to the floor, stiff, <coughs> shaking, um, this is the, their first seizure, and that's how we would evaluate it was if they had their first seizure. The last one is just for kicks here. A uh, two-year-old girl brought to your pediatrician with a two-week two history of events concerning procedures. 
Mother reports that they have these near daily events of lying on the floor after lunch and have these rhythmic leg movements lasting two to five minutes and frequently she'll go to sleep right after these. Her growth and development have been normal. What's your differential diagnosis? I'll throw this out there just to try to do it more quickly. This could be a rhythmic movement disorder. We see this not in commonly in kids that are autistic, et cetera. It could also be infantile masturbation or it could be seizures. Things to ask are, call their name. Many times the kids are just having some rhythmic movement disorder. They'll look up after you because you're telling them all the time to stop stimming. Um, if that doesn't every once, go over and pick them up. The kids are having rhythmic movement disorder. They'll instantly stop uh, doing their stem and kind of look at you like, what's well, rough, I wasn't paying attention. If this is infantile masturbation, they may actually get upset with you and want to be put back down on the floor to finish their activity. And if this is seizures, um, meaning that they're continuing to do the movement, pinch them on the shoulder, no response, that's a seizure until proven otherwise. Thank you. If you got questions, feel free to give me a text page, call me. Um, I'll be happy to answer those. And I apologize for running over this afternoon a little bit. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank <laughs> you.